A few days ago, on August 20th, Malaysia banned famed Muslim apologist Zakir Naik from public speaking, including via social media, after he made apparently racist remarks during a speech to a Muslim audience. Since Naik has been living in Malaysia to avoid prosecution in India, this ban essentially ends his Dawah career, at least for the time being. Today, I will analyze Naik's remarks, review how he found himself in this situation, compare his actions to what Islam teaches, and briefly look at the present religious breakdown in Malaysia. I am currently working on a series of videos looking at how we should understand apparent contradictions in the Bible. However, when I saw on the news that the world's most famous Muslim apologist, Zakir Naik, got himself into legal trouble yet again, I had to put those plans on hold. A few weeks ago, I did a video about a prominent Muslim YouTube channel's attempts to censor critics of Islam. I warned about the dangers of censorship, and today we see it in action as the Muslim-majority Malaysian government has shut down Nike because it didn't like something he said. How ironic. There's a lot to talk about here, but first an overview of the present situation. On August 8th, Nike made the following remarks to a Muslim audience. You know, somebody called me a guest, so I said, before me, the Chinese are the guest. They aren't born here. So if you want the new guest to go first, ask the old guest to go back. And also said, The Hindus in Malaysia get more than 100 times more rights than the Muslims in India. These remarks led to 115 complaints about hate speech to the police. The inflammatory clips made the news and caused a strong backlash. Nike was soon questioned and issued an apology. More on that in a moment. After reviewing the full tape of Nike's speech, the Malaysian police issued an order banning Nike from any sort of public speech, whether it be open to the public or behind closed doors. The order also bans him from using any form of media until the case is resolved. As a non-citizen permanent resident, Malaysian law forbids Nike from engaging in race-based political speech. Nike, of course, claims that he was misunderstood and his comments weren't racist or political. Let's take a look at the broader context. First, the clip on ethnically Chinese people. This comes as part of his prepared remarks on how Islam supposedly didn't spread by the sword. Which army came to Malaysia? Which army went to Indonesia? The majority, almost all, were non-Muslim, then almost all became Muslim, mashallah. And later on, now there are people coming afterwards. Malaysia make him fully Muslim. Then you had the Chinese coming, you had the Indian coming, the British is coming. They are our new guest. You know, somebody called me a guest. So I said, before me, the Chinese are the guest. They aren't born here. So if you want the new guest to go first, ask the old guest to go back. The Chinese, they're not born here, most of them. So maybe the new generation, yes. I think that's enough. But I'll link to the timestamp where the quote can be found in the full three and a half hour original down in the video description. That way you can review it for yourself. Warning, Nike's full argument on how we supposedly know Islam never spread by the sword is so bad it'll make your brain hurt. You've been warned. Back to the clip. Notice the flow of what Nike is saying. First, some people came and made Malaysia entirely Muslim. Then some non-Muslim Chinese people came. Then he came. If people want to kick him, a non-citizen, out, then surely they have to kick out the old guest ethnically Chinese citizens, too. Also, notice tone. Nike apparently thinks this is funny. Surely, if a great Muslim like him doesn't belong in Malaysia, then those non-Muslim, non-Malay people don't belong there either. Side note, this is pure revisionist fantasy by Nike. There was never a time when Malaysia was entirely Muslim, or anything close to it. Now let's look at the other clip. This comes in response to a question. Nike is explaining why he came to Malaysia from India. Talking about the problems of India, he remarks, Here are the non-Muslims. The Hindus are 6.3%, 6.4%. The Hindus in Malaysia get more than 100 times more rights than the Muslims in India. Good, Alhamdulillah, I'm not saying take away their rights. Good. 
This is what Muslims should do. They are half the percentage, numbers wise very less, half the percentage of India where Muslims are. <clears throat> Yet the rights they get here is 100 times more than what India gives rights to minority. So much so that they support the Prime Minister of India but not Prime Minister of Malaysia. Notice how he starts out the clip by saying that the Indian government treats Muslims poorly but then shifts to saying that most Hindus living in Malaysia support India rather than Malaysia. He is thus accusing Malaysian citizens of being disloyal to their government. That's a very serious charge. Worse, he is implying they are disloyal because they like governments that mistreat Muslims. If that isn't religious stereotyping and hate speech, I don't know what is. Now, let's take a look at a couple more clips from the same speech that didn't make it into the news. Unprompted, Nike brings up the mistreatment of Muslim people by the Chinese government. Today, the Muslims that are harassed the most in the world, according to me, it's not the Palestinian, it is the Chinese Uyghur Muslim. After suggesting Muslim countries are too afraid and weak to criticize China, he continues, Imagine when our Muslim brothers are dying, they are being killed, they are being tortured. In China, at least in Palestine, they can pray openly. In Palestine, they can fight openly. They can do jihad openly. They can fast. In China, these Shing and Muslims, most of them aren't allowed to pray. They aren't allowed to fast. They are forced to drink alcohol in Ramadan. If you object, they put you in concentration camp, called as a re-education camp. By itself, nothing too offensive here, but it clearly plays into an anti-Chinese understanding of his prepared remarks. Later, he calls on the majority Muslim population of Malaysia to unite. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may the Muslims of Malaysia be united. If you are united, you are a stronger force. If you are divided, you will become weak. By itself, nothing outrageous. But this also plays into the us versus them narrative he seemed to set up in his prepared remark. Then Nike says the following in an attempt to defend Sharia law. 15% of the criminals are registered in the Home Ministry Department, if you go to the website. And 15, majority 85% are non-Muslim. 45% Hindus, Chinese about 30%. As near as I can tell, this information is completely made up. There's no indication online that the Malaysian government tracks crime by religion, and it would be rather weird if they did. Nor do the official or even unofficial websites list crime by ethnicity. The government does break crime down by state. However, I looked at this data and found no correlation between the percent Muslim in a given state and the crime rate. Note also that the percentages don't even add up to 100%, but rather 90. Another indication Nike is making stuff up off the top of his head. And apparently, math is a big problem for Nike, as later in the talk, he corrects a questioner. Before I answer your question, he repeated twice that the population of non-Muslims is 30%. I don't know where you get a statistic from your uh, member of state assembly. According to the statistics I read, it is 27%. Muslims are 63%. Exactly. So, 63% Muslim apparently means non-Muslims are 27% of the population. How interesting. And this from the self-professed math expert. But if you ask the Christian church, in the catechism, they tell you that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they aren't three persons, they are one person. Person, 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 but not three person, one person. What language is this? One plus one plus one is equal to three. It's not equal to one. Yeah, no Christian actually believes that. But Nike is an expert on something. Using the straw man fallacy to make himself look smart to ignorant audiences. Back to the subject at hand. Notice how in addition to making up statistics to justify Sharia law, Nike is conflating religion and ethnicity. Muslim, Chinese, Indian. Apparently those Chinese and Indian people aren't good enough to be real Muslims in Nike's eyes. 
Finally, note that Indian people make up just 7% of the Malaysian population, yet Nike ascribes 45% of the crime to this minority. That's an outrageous claim. Clearly, Nike hates India. Whether that stems from his legal troubles with the Indian government, or reflects deep-seated hatred for Hindus, I'll leave it up to you to decide. Knight continues with his obvious contempt for ethnically Indian people. So what do you understand? This is all those who are speaking, they're not following the law of the country. The Malaysian police says, I'm innocent. So they are more bothered about the Indian police which is fabricating. They are more Indian than Malaysian. <laughs> Yikes. And finally... And here, mashallah, Malaysia is a good scope. Mashallah. It is ingrained in the constitution of Malaysia, according to my study, that no non-Muslim can do dawa to the Muslim. It's not allowed by law. Mashallah, very good. But a Muslim can do dawa. So there you have it. China is evil. India is evil. Chinese people made Malaysia non-Muslim. Hindus in Malaysia are loyal only to India. And the government is right to forbid people from promoting non-Muslim religions. But no religious or racial hate here. Just some out-of-context quotes. After all, Nike is a medical doctor, so he couldn't be filled with hatred regardless of what his words indicate. Now let's take a look at Nike's so-called apology. He begins. This success could not be digested by the detectors. Since the last few days, I've been accused of causing racial discord in the country. So he starts by saying it is a conspiracy to stop his amazing talk that converted used numbers of non-Muslims. Do we have non-Muslim today in this hall? Do we have non-Muslim among the civil servants in Kelantan? That's strange. You are given the first preference to ask the questions before the Muslims. One question from the gentleman's side. On the first station, please, mic number one. Please put forward your question. Anybody? I wonder where all these converts came from. Do we have one at least non-Muslim here? Yeah, we have, alhamdulillah. Well, there you go. After much searching, they found one non-Muslim in the audience. A very fertile ground for conversions, no doubt. I can see why the authorities would be scared. Well, actually, most government workers are Muslims, so maybe they were scared at how embarrassingly bad the turnout for Nike's event was, or something like that. Midway through the video, Nike switches from conspiracy and self-justification to the actual apologizing. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, that is God consciousness, that is righteousness, that is piety. Even though I have clarified myself, I feel I owe an apology to everyone whose feelings were hurt because of this misunderstanding. Notice the dramatic shift in tone. To me it sounds like he's trying really hard to fake sincerity, but judge for yourself. A link to the full apology is found in the video description. After his pseudo-apology, Nike says that Islam is against racism and quotes Muhammad's so-called farewell speech to prove it. Problem is, the racial part of this speech is a fraud. It doesn't appear in either of the ancient versions of the speech, first appearing in a 1987 English translation. More on that in a later video. On Nike, note what he doesn't do. He doesn't apologize for disparaging anyone based on their religion. Race is a very sensitive issue in Malaysia, and Nike has been warned about seemingly racist remarks in the past. But let's be generous and say his remarks weren't intended as racist. That means he's an idiot who is unable to figure out how his Chinese comment would be perceived. Remember that this is part of his prepared remarks and not something just off the top of his head. It also just means that he thinks ethnically Chinese and Indian people are inferior for their religion rather than their race. Big deal. I wonder where he got that idea, though. Indeed.
They who disbelieved among the people of the scripture and the polytheists will be in the fire of hell, abiding eternally therein. Those are the worst of creatures. Indeed, they who have believed and done righteous deeds, those are the best of creatures. So there you have it. It does appear that Nike violated the terms of his non-citizen permanent resident status. To review, I'm not a fan of censorship even if it is of a buffoon like Nike. But how does Nike feel about censorship? And when you were asked about Christians uh, having the rights or not having the rights in countries such as Saudi Arabia. I know Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran says clearly only religion is Islam. So if anyone comes to preach a religion which is not correct, I will not allow. Hmm. So it's good for the governments to censor non-Muslim teachings. Let's see what else he says. So similarly in Islam, if someone leaves the religion and propagates the wrong faith, it is like treason, and in Islam the punishment is death. So those who speak against Islam deserve not just censorship, but death. It seems Nike is a victim of what he himself supports. Hard to feel sorry for someone who wants to censor opposing voices. But how did he find himself in this situation to begin with? On July 1, 2016, five terrorists took control of a bakery in Dhaka, Bangladesh. By the time the attack was over, 29 people were dead. It was quickly discovered that one of the terrorists was influenced by Nike and had reposted a video of Nike seeming to encourage terrorism on his social media. Every Muslim should be a terrorist! The Bangladeshi government quickly accused Nike of contributing to the attack and India promised to investigate. Nike, who was out of the country at the time, initially said he would return in a couple of weeks and would be happy to cooperate. He never did, however, and in November India's National Investigation Agency filed an official complaint against him and his Islamic Research Foundation. Nike soon officially moved to Malaysia where he was given permanent resident status. Nike has claimed the video we just witnessed was doctored, a claim that is not credible. Fans have suggested he was taken out of context, so let's watch a bit more. If he's on the truth, if he's fighting the enemies of Islam, I'm for him. I don't know what he's doing. I'm not in touch with him. I don't know him personally. I read newspapers. If he's terrorizing the terrorist, if he's terrorizing America, the terrorist, biggest terrorist, I'm with him. Every Muslim should be a terrorist. The thing is that if he's terrorizing a terrorist, he's following Islam. Whether he is or not, I don't know. This answer was given in response to a question about the Taliban. In fairness to Nike, he does waffle at the end and says he doesn't know if the Taliban are terrorists or not. This waffling, however, clearly shows that it's not a doctored video, as no one would include that if they were trying to make it look like Nike unequivocally supports terror. On the other hand, this is Osama bin Laden and the Taliban we're talking about. There is no way that Nike actually didn't know what the Taliban stood for. It seems clear he was more or less endorsing terror, but leaving himself some room to deny that he supported the Taliban if necessary. And this quote reflects a long-standing pattern of Nike staying just short of outright endorsing terrorism, but leaving the door open to saying he was actually against it if he needed to. The only other possibility is that he's a complete charlatan who is trying his best not to offend anyone in order to maximize his donations. Let's compare Nike's views on waging war and terrorism to that of Muhammad. All his apostles said, I have been sent with the shortest expressions bearing the widest meanings, and I have been made victorious with terror cast in the hearts of the enemy. And the Quran... O oh, believers, fight the unbelievers who are near you, and let them find in you a harshness, and know that God is with the God-fearing. When India began to investigate Nike, they quickly found that his so-called charity was a fraud. According to the government investigators, Nike's Islamic Research Foundation obtained around $28 million U.S. worth of criminal assets. The charity was used as a front to launder this money, which ultimately may have funded terrorism. Additionally, Nike is accused of taking funds donated as zakat, that is, obligatory Muslim charity intended to go to the poor, and using it to line his own pockets. 
The investigation found some 20 residents purchased by the charity for various members of Nike's family, and nearly $2 million U.S. routed through bank accounts of his mother, father, and sister to purchase properties obtained from unknown sources. In March 2019, a close aide of Nike's was arrested on charges related to the fraud. Naturally, none of these accusations have been proven in court since Nike refuses to stand trial, preferring to run from the law instead of facing justice. Even if found guilty, Nike has little to worry about from Allah, though. The earliest biography of Muhammad records an incident where a man had hidden a treasure that Muhammad wanted. Kanani al-Rabi, who had the custody of the treasure of Banu Nadir, was brought to the apostle who asked him about it. He denied that he knew where it was. The apostle said to Kanana, Do you know that if we find you have it, I shall kill you? He said, Yes. Some of the treasure was found. When the apostle asked him about the rest, he refused to produce it. So the apostle gave orders to Al-Zabir al-Awam, Torture him until you extract what he has. So he kindled a fire with flint and steel on his chest until he was nearly dead. If it is okay for the so-called best example for all humanity to torture a man for money, then surely it is okay for Nike to launder money for criminals and keep his sheepish followers zakat for himself. After all, Muhammad got 20% of all war booty, so surely Islam's best apologist is worthy of keeping 2.5% of his followers' wealth. And keep it he has. Although unproven, Malaysian media speculate that Nike attained permanent residence status by depositing $2 million U.S. in Malaysia. Under the country's law, such a deposit guarantees a person permanent residence status as long as they leave the money on deposit for five years. This law is often used by criminals to flee their home countries. So there you have it. Nike waffled on terror for years, refusing to condemn anyone. He used his charity to launder money for criminals, possibly including terrorists. He inspired terrorists. Then, when he finally came under fire for all of this, he claimed that he was against terrorism and would gladly face questioning in India. Instead of following through, however, he fled to Malaysia. All the while, he was lining his own pockets with donations intended as zakat to help poor Muslims. In Malaysia, he continued to face criticism and had every reason to know that he was on thin ice. However, his arrogance got the better of him and he mouthed off on racial issues, something his permanent residence status expressly forbids him from doing. I'm not sure what the most pathetic part of this story is. Nike's terrible command of logic, his thefts from his followers, his arrogance that got him into even more trouble, that he is still supported by millions of Muslims, or that none of what Nike did can really be condemned when compared to the Quran and Muhammad. One question remains. Is Nike so deluded and stupid that he believes his own crap, or is he a charlatan that knowingly speaks lies to make money? On the one hand, things like making up statistics at will and stealing from his charity suggests he's a charlatan. On the other hand, being unwilling to outright condemn unpopular terrorists suggests he believes in the Quran's teachings. Nike clearly has a good memory, and much of his fame is based on his ability to quote chapter and verse number at will for various Quran and Bible passages. However, intelligence and memory are largely unrelated things. Nike's command of logic, and as we've seen, basic math, is poor. He often makes terrible arguments for Islam, not so much because of the content, but because of his inability to string together a cogent argument. If he is willing to make up information, and he clearly is, he could easily make much stronger sounding arguments. So his intelligence is quite questionable. Nike is clearly unethical but being a charlatan requires more than just hypocritical ethics. It requires knowing that what you are professing to teach is false and doing it anyway for personal gain. Nike likely does know that some of what he says is false, but could well believe that his lies are justified in order to support Islam. Perhaps the old adage that there is no reason to suggest malice where simple stupidity will suffice is the best explanation. Nike has shown himself to be a fool, but he has not shown himself to be knowingly saying foolish things. Finally, I'd like to end this otherwise negative video on a positive note 
with a brief overview of the present situation in Malaysia. According to the official 2010 census, Malaysia was 61% Muslim, 20% Buddhist, 9% Christian, and 6% Hindu. However, the official census has several significant problems. Most notably, all ethnically Malay people are considered Muslim by law. A Malay person who does not wish to be called Muslim is simply out of luck. They are defined as Muslim and will be counted as such regardless of their wishes. The Malays make up 51% of the Malaysian population, meaning only 10 percentage points of the Muslim population comes from the other 49% of the population. Of course, actual belief is not determined by government mandate. Independent estimates suggest only 50 to 55% of the population is actually Muslim. Buddhism is also grossly overestimated in the official census, with many Buddhists actually practicing traditional Chinese religions. Christianity is indeed about 9% of the population, according to independent estimates. This is up from 5% 40 years ago, and from less than 2% 100 years ago. Islam, in contrast, is not growing as a percentage of the population, despite a higher than average birth rate among the Malay people, and may actually be shrinking. This suggests that conversions out of Islam are far more common than conversions into it. A Muslim who noticed the lack of growth of Islam asked Nike about it in the same talk as his racial remarks. Nike's brilliant reply was that since Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, it must also be the fastest growing religion in Southeast Asia and in Malaysia specifically. Islam is the fastest religion throughout the world. The percentage there may be more, but even in Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, including Indonesia, including Almost all the countries, Islam is the fastest growing religion. Nike is technically correct about Islam being the fastest growing religion in the world. But see my video entitled, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, but will that last, to learn why this statistic is highly deceptive. However, that by no means suggests that Islam is also the fastest growing in every country. Indeed, it could be shrinking in many places and still be the fastest growing overall if the growth is extremely high in some areas. As usual, Nike's command of logic is quite poor. He then goes on to cite some anecdotes and totally irrelevant information such as the number of Islamic schools in Malaysia as further proof that he's right. As alluded to and praised by Nike, it is illegal to evangelize the Muslim population in most of Malaysia. Muslims, even ones who've never actually practiced Islam, wishing to officially convert to another religion must petition a Sharia court. In response, the court can send the person to a faith rehabilitation center for up to one year of brainwashing. I, I, mean, I mean education. In five states, conversion can also be punished by fine or jail sentence. Parents can have their children taken from them, and all converts face extreme social pressures. Additionally, Christian movies and other media are often censored by the government. As such, there are officially zero ex-Muslim converts to Christianity in Malaysia. The reality, of course, is different. Despite all these difficulties, Christianity, and in particular Muslim converts, are on the rise. Mufti Harusani Zakaria has spoken regularly on the growing apostasy problem. In 2006, he estimated there were around 100,000 ex-Muslims based on a survey of Malay professionals. In 2009, he was banned from several mosques for repeatedly claiming around 200,000 Malay Muslims had secretly converted to Christianity. I guess these mosques, like the Malaysian government, are more interested in illusionary numbers than true believers. By 2011, Zakaria estimated that there were as many as 260,000 converts to Christianity, most of whom continued to hide their conversion publicly. God is on the move in Malaysia, and neither the government's definitions, Sharia courts, or Zakir Naik can stop him. Thanks for watching.